Purgatory Explained, Part 2, Chapter 62, Means to Avoid Purgatory, Christian Mortification. The third means of satisfying in this world is the practice of Christian mortification and religious obedience. We bear about in our body the mortification of Jesus, says the Apostle, that the life also of Jesus may be made manifest in our bodies. 2 Corinthians 4.10 This mortification of Jesus, which the Christian must bear about in him, is in its broadest sense the part that he must take in the sufferings of his divine master by bearing in union with him the trials he may have to encounter in this life or the suffering which he voluntarily inflicts upon himself. The first and best mortification is that which is attached to our daily duties, the pains we have to take, the effort we must make to acquit ourselves properly of the duties of our state, and to bear the contradictions of each day. When St. John Berkman said that his chief mortification was the common life. He said nothing else than this, because for him the common life embraced all the duties of his state. Moreover, he who satisfies the duties and sufferings of each day, and who thus practices fundamental mortification, will soon advance and impose voluntary privations, and sufferings upon himself in order to escape the pains of the other life. The slightest mortifications, the most trifling sacrifice, especially when done through obedience, are of great value in the sight of God. Blessed Emily, a Dominican and prioress of the monastery of St. Mary at Vercelli, inspired her religious with a spirit of perfect obedience in view of purgatory. One of the points of the rule prohibited the religious to drink between meals without express permission of the superior. Now the latter, knowing, as we have seen, the value of the sacrifice of a glass of water in the eyes of God, was generally accustomed to refuse this permission that she might afford her sisters an opportunity to practice an easy mortification. But she sweetened her refusal by telling them to offer their thirst to Jesus, tormented by a cruel thirst upon the cross. Then she advised them to suffer this slight privation with a view of dismissing their torments in the expiatory flames of purgatory. There was in her community a sister named Mary Isabella, who was too prone to levity, being fond of conversation and other exterior distractions. The consequence was that she had little relish for prayer, was negligent in reciting the office, and only acquitted herself of this, her chief duty, with the greatest repugnance. Thus she was never in any haste to go to choir, and as soon as the office was ended, she was the first to go out. One day, while she was hurrying to leave the choir, she passed by the stall of the prioress, who stopped her. Where are you going in such haste, my good sister? she said to her, and why are you so anxious to get out before the other sisters? The sister, taken by surprise, at first observed a respectful silence. Then she acknowledged with humility that the office was wearisome to her and seemed too long. That is all very well, replied the prioress. But if it cost you so much to chant the praises of God seated comfortably in the midst of your sisters, what will you do in purgatory? where you will be obliged to remain in the midst of flames. To spare you that terrible trial, my daughter, 
I order you to leave your place the last of all. The sister submitted with simplicity, like a truly obedient child. She was recompensed. The disgust which she had experienced thus far for the things of God was changed into devotion and spiritual joy. Moreover, as God revealed to Blessed Emily, having died some time after, afterwards, she obtained a great diminution of the sufferings which awaited her in the other life. God counted as so many hours in purgatory, the hours which she passed in prayer through the spirit of obedience. Diario Dominicano May 3rd, Merv 16. Purgatory Explained, Part 2, Chapter 63. Means to avoid purgatory, the sacraments, receiving them promptly. We have indicated as a fourth means of satisfying in this world the use of the sacraments, and especially a holy and Christian reception of the last sacraments on the approach of death. The Divine Master admonishes us in the Gospel to prepare ourselves well for death, in order that it may be precious in his eyes and the worthy crowning of a Christian life. His love for us makes him desire ardently that we should leave this world entirely purified, divested of all debt toward divine justice, and that on appearing before God we should be found worthy to be admitted among the elect, without need of passing through purgatory. It is for this end that he ordinarily sends us to pains of sickness before death, and that he has instituted the sacrament to aid us in sanctifying our sufferings, and the more perfectly to dispose us to appear before his face. The sacraments which we receive in time of sickness are three. Confession, which we, we may receive as soon as we wish. Holy viaticum and extreme unction, which we may receive as soon as there is danger of death. This circumstance of the danger of death must be taken in the broad sense of the word. It is not necessarily that there should be an eminent danger of dying, and that all hope of recovery be lost. It is not even necessary that the danger of death be certain. It suffices that it be probable and prudently presumed even when there is no other infirmity than old age. See a pamphlet approved by all the bishops of Belgium and entitled The Medicine of the Families, Brussels, Mason, Jomer. The effects of the sacraments well received correspond to all the needs, all the lawful desires of the sick. These divine remedies purify the soul from her sins and increase her treasure of sanctifying grace. They fortify the sick person and enable him to bear his sufferings with patience, to triumph over the assault of the demon at the last moment, and to make a generous sacrifice of his life to God. Moreover, besides the effects which they produce upon the soul, the sacraments exert a salutary influence upon the body. Extreme unction especially comforts the sick person and alleviates his sufferings. It even restores him to health, if God judges it expedient for his salvation. The sacraments are then, for the faithful, an immense assistance, an inestimable, inestimable benefit. <clears throat> it is not, therefore, surprising that the enemy of souls makes it his first objective to deprive them of so great a good. 
not being able to rob the church of her art sacraments, she endeavors to keep them from the sick, either by making them entirely neglect to receive them, or that they receive them so late as to lose all their benefit. Alas, how many souls allow themselves to be taken in this snare? How many souls, for not promptly receiving the sacraments, fall into hell, or into deepest, the deepest abyss of purgatory? To avoid this misfortune, the first care of a Christian, in case of sickness, must be to think of the sacraments, and to receive them as promptly as possible. We say that we should receive them promptly, whilst he is still in possession of the use of his faculties, and we dwell upon this circumstance for the following reasons. In receiving the sacraments promptly, the patient having yet sufficient strength to prepare himself properly, der derives all the fruits of them. He needs to be provided as soon as possible with the divine assistance in order to support his sufferings, to overcome temptation, and to sanctify the precious time of sickness. It is only by receiving the holy oils in time that we can experience the effects of a bodily cure. For well, we must here remark an important point. The sacramental remedy of the holy unction produces its, its effect upon the sick person in the same manner as medical remedies. It resembles an exquisite medicine that assists nature, in which there is still supposed to be a certain vigor, so that extreme unction cannot exercise a medicinal virtue when nature has become too feeble and life is almost extinguished. Thus, a great number of sick persons die because they put off receiving the sacraments until they are at the last extremity, whilst it is not unusual to see those entirely recover who hasten to receive them. St. Alphonsus speaks of a sick man who delayed to receive extreme unction until it was almost too late, for he died shortly afterwards. Now, God made known oh, by way of revelation, says the holy doctor, that if he had received the sacrament earlier, he would have been restored to health. However, the most precious effect of the last sacraments is that which they produce upon the soul. They purify it from the remains of sin and take away or at least diminish its debt of temporal punishment. They strengthen it to bear suffering in a holy manner. They fill it with confidence in God and assist it to accept death from his hands in union with that of Jesus Christ. Purgatory Explained, Part 2, Chapter 64, Means to Avoid Purgatory, Confidence in God. The fifth means for obtaining favor before the tribunal of God is to have great confidence in his mercy. In thee, O Lord, have I hoped. Let me never be confounded, says the prophet in Psalm 30. Surely he who said to the good thief, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise, well merits that we should have an unbounded confidence in him. St. Francis de Sales avowed that if he considered his misery only, he deserved hell, but full of humble confidence in the mercy of God and in the merits of Jesus Christ, he firmly hoped to share the happiness of the elect. And what would our Lord do with his eternal life? Said he, 
if not give it to us poor little insignificant creatures as we are, who have no hope but in his goodness. Blessed be God. I have this firm confidence in the depth of my heart that we shall live eternally with God. We shall one day be all united in heaven. Take courage. We shall soon be there above. We must, he said again, die between two pillows, the one of the humble confession that we merit nothing but hell, the other of an entire confidence that God, in his mercy, will give us paradise. Having one day met a gentleman who was filled with excessive fear of the judgments of God, he said to him, He who has a true desire to serve God and to avoid sin must in no wise allow himself to be tormented by the thought of death and judgment. If they are to be feared, it is not with that fear that dejects and depresses the vigor of the soul, but a fear tempered with confidence and therefore salutary. Hope in God. Who hopes in him shall never be confounded. We read in the life of St. Philip Neri that having gone one day to the convent of St. Martha in Rome, one of the religious named Scholastica desired to speak to him in private. This lady had been tormented for a long time with the thought of despair which she had not dared to make known to anyone, but full of confidence in the saint, she resolved to open her heart to him. When she went to him, before she had time to say a word, the man of God said to her with a smile, You are very wrong, my daughter, to believe that you are destined for eternal flames. Paradise belongs to you. I cannot believe it, Father she replied with a deep sigh. You do not believe it? That is folly on your part. You will see. Tell me, Scholastica, for whom did Jesus die? He died for sinners. And now tell me, are you a saint? Alas, replied she, weeping, I am a great sinner. Therefore Jesus died for you, and most assuredly it was to open heaven for you. It is thus clear that heaven is yours, for as to your sins, you detest them, I have no doubt. The good religious was touched by these words. Light entered her soul, the temptation vanished, and from that moment those sweet words, Paradise is yours, filled her with confidence and joy. <laughs>